We're here in Split, Croatia for the 23rd World Congress of the World Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons. And uh, very honored to have with us today uh, Sir Terence English, one of the pioneers of heart surgery and also heart transplantation uh, in Europe. Um, and um, so uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions, Terence, if I may. Beginning with your early childhood, I know that you were born in Africa and spent a lot of your early years in Africa. Would you tell us about that? Mm. Well, I uh, had the misfortune of never, never having had a father. He died when I was 14 months old. And uh, my mother was a widow with two young children, my sister and me, and not particularly well off, but she was uh, a wonderful mother and uh, managed to get me a, a good education. We had a, we had a nice uh, upbringing in Johannesburg. Um, I then qualified in mining engineering at Wits University in Joburg. Uh, my father had been a mining engineer and I thought I'd like to follow in his footsteps. And then uh, when I was 21, I somewhat unexpectedly came into an, inher an inheritance of uh, 2,000 pounds. And I, by that time I'd been strongly influenced by an uncle of mine who was a surgeon, um, my mother's youngest brother, and I thought I'd like to do medicine. And so I took my 2,000 pounds and went to England, got into Guy's Medical School, and uh, and uh, eventually qualified from, uh, from there as a doctor. So you were probably a little older than most. Or how old were you when you qualified? I was, I was 30 when I qualified because I came to, to England when I was 23. I had to start at the beginning in the uh, first year. Then I uh, broke for a year. I'd been working in Canada beforehand in mining exploration to augment my, my uh, funds. And I took a year out, was very lucky to be taken back in again by the dean of the medical school, George Houston, who, believe it or not, um, I saw his name in the, in the uh, Times in November under the birthdays, and he was 96 years old. So I wrote him a little letter, and I thanked him yet again for taking me back into to, uh, guys when he had no need to. Uh, he was a well, remarkable man. Mm. He must have been very gratified to see how things had finally turned out for, for you and his selection. Well, Stuart, yes. I, uh, I felt I owed him a lot and I worked very hard when I got back. And, uh, but there was two great uh, uh, things when we, we met at, at, a, at an occasion at Guy's, just when I'd become president of the Royal College of Surgeons. And it was a delight to be able to thank him again at that stage. Uh, and then, I think three years later, we were both uh, given honorary doctorates from, from Guy's and St. Thomas's at the same time in Southwark Cathedral, the, the two of us. So uh, th that was a very happy association. Yeah. You know, uh, I often reflect that uh, the successful man is somebody who can deal with failure, not somebody who can deal with success, mm -hmm. and everybody can deal with success. And you uh, probably had a harder road to get to medical school and to graduate than most people, and subsequent to that, you overcame many challenges to have a very successful career. Do you think that the early challenges in some way prepared you for your later life? I think so. I really do. And uh, I... I uh, sort of have a, an existential view of uh, the world and I believe that the way you deal with your experiences and your existence, the failures and the successes, uh, somehow create your, go towards creating your essence, which is what you become and what you are. So I think those early setbacks are important. Um, but there is a lot of good luck along the way too. Um, I, I ended up working for two really wonderful uh, cardiac surgeons in Donald Ross and, and, uh, uh, and Sir Russell Brock. Um, my, my, my entry into cardiac surgery was, a, was an unusual one. Serendipity, again, playing its role. 
because I'd worked uh, for the senior cardiologist at Guy's in my last six months as a houseman, George Baker. And uh, he asked me what I was going to do at the end of the six months. And I said, well, Dr. Baker, I'd really like to do cardiology. And he said, well, maybe you ought to go and see what the surgeons are doing for six months and then come back and you'll be a better cardiologist. And so I said to him, but you know, uh, Sir Russell's not going to want to train uh, would-be physicians. He wants to train surgeons. And Dr. Baker, bless him, said, leave it to me, English, leave it to me. And uh, he... he persuaded Brock to take me, I think, as his SHO. And, you know, six, eight weeks later, I knew I was never going back to cardiology because that was 1963. And it was a fascinating time in the thoracic unit at Guy's, you know, with uh, Don Ross doing his early homograft work. He was so innovative and, and uh, into the, the whole field of congenital cardiac surgery, homograft surgery aneurysms, a wonderful technical surgeon and a, a really super guy to work for. I, I admired Donald immensely. Brock, on the other hand, was a very different person. Donald Ross had been his senior registrar and he'd appointed him uh, about two years before I started uh, in the unit. Brock was a, a very driven, austere, difficult man, very high standards particularly for himself as well as for others and uh, not a not a great technical surgeon he was a very fine clinician but he'd grown up in the pre-world war one era in surgery and he used big instruments and he'd get frustrated that he he knew what to do but he didn't know how to do it perfectly whereas donald ross could so Brock used to get very frustrated in the operating room and he'd uh, give everybody a hard time and the SHO got the hardest time. He was sort of the cat that got kicked. Um, but I, again, I admired, I admired Brock immensely. He, uh, and if you worked for him and he thought you'd done a good job, he was very loyal in, in supporting his, his people who he'd, he'd trained. He was a great man. Mm. So then you went to Cambridge. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you know, did the usual route. I uh, did my general surgery, and then I had uh, four years as a senior registrar on the Brompton National Heart Rotation. And uh, at the end of my fourth year, I'd, I was working again for Matt Paneth, who I knew very well and who you know only too well. And one day uh, around uh, October time, in '72. Uh, we were operating in, at the Brompton, and he turned to uh, the anaesthetist, Ian English, and he said, Ian, how do you think English would get on with Milstein? Now, I thought this was a slightly suspicious question, and I said, well, who's Milstein? <laughs> uh, uh, Matt said, well, he's a, 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 an irascible surgeon who's looking for a locum, and he works in a, a little a village called Papworth in the Cambridge Fens. Uh, and uh, he, Matt said, well, you ought to you know, go and see him. And I did, and I got the locum. And during the next three months, I really got to admire Ben Milstein. And um, at the end of the time, when the job was advertised, he said he, he would like me to, to, to work with him and that we ought to try and run the unit as partners and share, share the junior staff, share the facilities, and really work together. And that appealed to me a lot, and uh, we did that. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a very good partnership, and it was good to see the trainees who were with us, see an older consultant and a younger consultant arguing perhaps about how a patient should be managed freely amongst themselves. And as often as not, we wouldn't know who was responsible for that particular patient. And so he get sister to bring the notes, and if it was mine, that's the way it would happen. If it was his, it would be another way. So he was, he was a, a great guy to work with mm. and uh, supported me a lot when I, I needed support. Mm. So, and you're one of the pioneers <coughs> of heart transplantation. Um, and there was a time in England when um, there had been some early events which hadn't worked, mm. and uh, both the government authorities and the public, I think, were somewhat against 
resuscitating heart transplantation, but mm. you did that and you were really responsible for bringing heart transplantation back to Britain and to much of Europe. Mm. So can you start at the beginning and take us through that story? Yes, well again, uh, serendipity was at play because <clears throat> I was aware of a little bit of what had been going on from 67 until 72 over those five years when I started as a consultant. But I went to Stamford to visit a friend of mine, Philip Caves, and while I was there I was influenced very much by what was going on there, the, the patients who were alive and living and Philip Cave's great enthusiasm for the future of heart transplantation. And he was very keen to, to start it when he'd finished it at Stamford and was going back to Scotland. But I also uh, thought it would be worth trying to, uh, to get something going at, uh, in Cambridge. And so when I got back, I, I uh, discussed it with Ben Milstein, my colleague, and he said he'd support it. And then I went to see Roy Kahn, who ran the liver and uh, kidney transplant program. It was a big, rec well-recognized one in Cambridge. And he was keen, so we decided we'd try and do a combined program. And uh, that, that really was very difficult and, and didn't work out. We, we started doing experiments in his lab, and tried to get a, um, approval for uh, the work to be done at Addenbrooke's and there was a lot of resistance because already the other disciplines said that Roy was taking too much of the cake with his, his big program. And um, so eventually I separated and decided that it had to be at Papworth and that caused some grief with, with Roy Kahn, understandably as it happened, but that's, that's what we did and we, we managed to get enough support from the health authority to do two cases and the second of those survived and did well and we, we took it from there and gradually managed to get funding and recognition uh, and then uh, eventually the uh, super regional designation from the Department of Health because there'd been this moratorium on it which I wasn't aware of when I started on this route but uh, became aware of it later and they were they were not keen to support it in the early days, but there was a very good report uh, done by independent research workers looking at the costs and the benefits of heart transplantation at Papworth and also at, at Herfield where Magdi was working by this time. And that persuaded uh, uh, the department that this was something worth doing. And so we got proper funding for, the two, for those two hospitals first. And, uh, and then as the work expanded, uh, other hospitals were designated and then funded in Newcastle, and then in Birmingham, and then in Manchester. It was a very good way of controlling the development of cardiac transplantation in the UK. Well, it's, it, it's always difficult to start a new program. And mm -hmm. I think starting a new program in heart transplantation that in those days was so visible. Mm. Um, and Lord Brock was quoted once as saying anybody who did heart transplantation should do it anonymously because <laughs> we're all aware of the tremendous yeah, yeah. influence the press yeah. had and so on. Yeah. But you were put in a difficult position with your first case mm. and I'm not sure everybody would have handled it the way that you did. Mm. Could you expand on that? What happened? Well, um, we Interestingly, we wanted to keep our plans absolutely secret. We didn't want people to know that we were going to do this because they'd be always saying, when are you going to start, what are you going to do? So uh, I'd actually, uh, one of the BBC reporters found out about this. Um, and I saw him and said, look, please don't do anything but in, until we've done our first case. And then after that, I'd be prepared to give you an interview. Well, we did the first case, and it was a failure. And the reason it was a failure was the man was very sick, and he had an arrest before uh, he, he was put onto bypass in the anaesthetic room, and he had suffered some brain damage. And although the heart worked fine, his brain didn't, and inevitably he died uh, after 17 days. And 
after the original publicity of the, the fact that we'd done it, there had to be one, uh, one interview, public interview, uh, which I attended. And then um, when he died, all hell broke loose mm -hmm. because pe those who were against it anyway uh, were very critical. The department didn't like it. Roy Kahn said I'd put cardiac transplantation back five years, said it publicly and so on. Um, but we, I, I knew that there was a future. And the way that heart had worked afterwards, so sick as the guy was, you know, we turned around his, his uh, cardiac state. And uh, so we, we went ahead with the second case. And, uh, and thankfully that went very smoothly. And the patient was a good one in that he was a very, uh, very resourceful Cockney builder from Wandsworth, and he just took the whole thing in his stride and, and became a bit of an icon and a bit of a celebrity. He used to cycle everywhere and learn how to play golf. And people loved Keith Castle, and so he did a lot for um, really publicizing the benefits of a heart transplant early on. But still there were problems with, with funding, with criticism from within the cardiology fraternity. But I, after Donald Ross's experience, when he did the first one in London, I, it was clear to me that we had to be very careful about uh, personalities. And so I very, very rarely uh, spoke either to the television or to the newspapers. And I know the Cambridge Evening News used to get so cross with me because the editor would phone me up and ask about a case. And I'd say, well, you know, Mr. Edwards knows all about this and he'll deal with it. He was the press officer and he was a wonderful ex-RAF man. And we kept him informed and he gave out the information. And I guess that was useful because I didn't personally get a lot of exposure and I think that was the, the medical profession generally felt that was a good thing after the huge exposure that that Barnard had got and then Donald Ross and so on. So we kept a fairly low profile and we kept very much uh, after John Warwick had joined me in, in November 81 it was very much a, a team, the Papworth team. It wasn't an individual who was, who was responsible for the work. And we began to, to get very good trainees um, because of the work we were doing, and, and they were excellent, and many of them became uh, consultants in the unit afterwards. And the current director, Steve Suey, is a, is a fantastic surgeon who heard about us when he was a schoolboy after the first case. And, and then as a medical student, decided he wanted to work at Papworth for a while, and he came out with us, and then became our resident, then our chief resident, then consultant colleague, and so on. So Papworth, being a single specialty hospital, this is one of the other factors which helped, I think, in the success, because we could focus very much on what we wanted to do. We didn't have to worry about general surgery or general medicine and so on, occupying beds. And we were focused and, and efficient. We were right out in, in, in the fens, difficult to get there. Uh, but once there, the patients loved it. There were nice grounds and so on, because the early ones stayed quite a while, as you would know from, from Stanford. And, and that side of it worked very well, I think. Well, you've left a wonderful legacy, but uh, let me just return to that first case. So uh, you, you knew that your personal career was likely linked to the <coughs> success of the transplant program. You, yeah. This was your baby. Yeah. You knew that the future of the heart transplant program, not only your program, mm. but the future in transplantation in England was likely linked to a successful outcome. Mm. Mm. You were faced with a patient who quite possibly would not recover mm. because of his mm. cerebral injury. Mm. You had the heart in your hands, but you mm. had a clear choice. Mm. You could have simply said, well, I accept mm. what the anesthesiologist says, mm. and uh, it's not practical to go ahead mm. with transplantation. Mm. 
knowing that everything that was at stake at that time, mm. Mm. I think many people would not have had the courage mm. to cast their future aside mm. Mm. and regarded solely the interests of the patient, which mm. clearly you did. Mm. Mm. And have you ever had any thoughts about that, any regrets? Do you think that everybody would have done that? No, um, but I think I, I haven't any regrets that I did it, although it ended in failure. But as you say, Stuart, um, I, I had the heart in my hand. I knew it was a good heart. I knew that this patient who'd been in hospital with us quite a long time, I'd got to know quite well. Um, my anaesthetist, Don Bethune, when he phoned me, he said, look, you know, his pupils dilated. They went down again. We can't be sure. We think he might have suffered brain damage. And I just had to give that guy the chance because um, I knew it was an incredibly difficult decision, but I knew he wasn't going to survive without it. And so we went ahead. And the, the really disappointing thing was, as I said, is that, that that operation went so well and I can remember the jubilation in theatres afterwards. You know, we finished about one o'clock in the morning, as you often do. And uh, everybody was thrilled when he came off bypass so well. And then the next morning he was, you know, d recovering really nicely, but he hadn't woken up properly. And then the next day he hadn't woken up properly. And it was the next, that day that I was, we had the, the, the big interview. And I had to, to say at the time that things had gone well, but I had a certain concern, uh, you know, that he might have suffered a little cerebral damage. I had to say that, I had to be open then. And, uh, you know, everybody latched on to that, and sure enough, he died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think through your perseverance and, and uh, single-mindedness, everything obviously worked out well in the end, and mm. you um, have founded a great program, left a great legacy. Uh, finally, just let me ask you, um, as somebody who's been responsible for a lot of the advances that we have today, how do you see cardiothoracic surgery 20 years from now? I mean, there have been huge advances in the last mm. 20 years. Mm. Where do you think this specialty will be in another two or three decades? Gosh, I'm not very good at predicting the future. I, ne I never have been. but. Uh I suppose I, I, I learned with interest uh, that last year in the United States, correct me if I'm wrong, that there were more VADs inserted than, than heart transplants. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so I've watched that development with, with interest and, and clearly, you know, it was always the challenge, the, the mechanical device as to uh, whether it's going to be used either in a, as an assist or a, a total heart replacement. So I guess in, in 20 years' time, I would see that there, there could well be a, a, a more user-friendly, reliable, total artificial heart, which, which could be used then to make up for the deficiencies in, in the donor supply. That's what's driving things, both with that and with the, and with the VADs. In the, and, and xenotransplantation, I, st I still have some confidence that it, it, in 20 years' time it might be a reality. Probably need that length of time. But I have great admira admiration for those who are working on it still and, and battling away with, with what is a very difficult problem. Outside of transplantation, in the general, um, in the general field, well, in thoracic surgery, I mean, uh, video-assisted thoracoscopic work has really transformed things. And I, I just get glimpses of that at times. I can see that developing. Um, and thoracic surgery becoming a much more well-recognized specialty instead of being a sort of poor sister of cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery itself, both the, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the congenital stuff has been so well-defined now, there'll probably be some slight improvements, but I can't see massive improvements. I think you've taken that a very long way already. Um, valves, valve design will improve, become more reliable. And then there's all the coronary work and the impact of the cardiologists on this. But um, 
I think David Taggart in, in Oxford has done a great job in trying to separate out the groups who really should be operated on by surgeons and those who should be uh, have stents by cardiologists and that refinement will continue I'm sure. Well thank you. Um, we're very grateful to you for all your time. Also very grateful for your wonderful contributions to our specialty over the last few decades. Thank you. Well if much. I may close by saying that one of my great pleasures in the last 30 years yet has been uh, First of all, meeting you when you were a, a resident at Stanford and the kindness you showed and uh, put me up in your, in your apartment and so on. And then all the years that have followed since then. So the, there have been a lot of good friendships along the way and ours has been a particularly good one. Thank well, you. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Terence.